Hi, I'm Robin Cohen. I'm an adult cardiothoracic surgeon from the Keck USC School of Medicine in Los Angeles. And the title of this roundtable discussion is Cardiothoracic Surgery, a Primer for the Media. As demand for information about healthcare goes up and people's access to that information versus the internet, social media, on their electronic devices, pressure is high on the media to report things both technologically correctly and accurately. Uh, the purpose of this discussion is to clarify who we are and what we do as cardiothoracic surgeons for the people who report about us. So let's just start. We have a very distinguished panel with us today, and why don't we just to start by introducing ourselves and, and tell us where you're from. My name is Keith Nonheim. I'm a general thoracic surgeon from St. Louis University. And I'm Doug Wood. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon from the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm Lauren Kane, and I'm a congenital heart surgeon from Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. So great. So Keith, sometimes the confusion starts um, with the definition of thoracic surgeons. You know, our, our board is the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. Our largest society is the Society for Thoracic mm -hmm. Surgery. Yet we're a group of much more diversity and, and different types of surgeons than that. Uh, explain to us how you become a, a cardiothoracic surgeon and, and what our organization's about. Yeah, it's interesting because you just heard a congenital surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon, and a general thoracic surgeon uh, essentially uh, uh, introduce themselves, and yet all their training was uh, very similar, uh, and they all have interests in the same specialty. Uh, the name thoracic surgery comes from the, the Greek thorax for chest, and, and originally it was uh, started as pretty much chest surgery, often uh, being done for TV. So cardiac surgery was essentially a latecomer. There was a lot more general thoracic or, or lung surgery being done. Uh, cardiac surgery came after that for adult cardiac surgery and, and kitty cardiac surgery, and nowadays there are really the field of thoracic or cardiothoracic thoracic surgery, it's called both, is comprised of three major subspecialties. Those who operate on kitty hearts, the congenital heart surgeons, they're the ones that take the little walnut hearts that have holes in them and fix them, which is in and of itself phenomenal. Those who do adult cardiac surgery, such as Dr. Cohen, who are doing the valve replacements and the coronary bypasses, and there are those of us who don't actually do heart surgery, we do the rest of the chest with regard to chest wall, esophagus, the lungs, and that's often known as general thoracic surgery. So there are three subspecialties, though they are all known both uh, under the rubric of cardiothoracic surgery or thoracic surgery, uh, a more historical term. So Doug, you'd be a, a thoracic surgeon, according to Keith. What diseases do you treat? Uh, what's unique about your specialty? And are there physicians out there who get confused for, for your specialty or what you do? Yeah, it's a great question, Robin, because um, general thoracic surgery, so as, as Keith was explaining, uh, surgery of kind of everything else in the chest uh, other than the heart, um, it, it's most commonly lung surgery, and I'd say what we're most commonly treating in terms of lung disease is lung cancer, so we're the primary specialist uh, taking care of surgery for lung cancer. The other common cancer area is esophageal cancer, uh, and so we're, we're also the primary specialty in, involved in that. Um, in terms of lung diseases, there are other benign lung diseases that sometimes we're involved with, uh, sometimes uh, aspects of surgery for emphysema, aspects of surgery for end-stage lung disease like lung transplantation. Uh, uh, that's all within the field of uh, general thoracic surgery. And then some less common but important areas like problems of the rib cage, sometimes congenital or tumor uh, involvement of the rib cage, or of the windpipe, uh, or the structures kind of in the middle part of the chest called the mediastinum. So those are all the areas that general thoracic surgeons uh, uh, take care of surgically. And there are areas of confusion sometimes because thoracic surgeons, general thoracic surgeons, go through specialized training in cardiothoracic surgery, just like Lauren and yourself. All four of us have taken essentially the same training and then subspecialize beyond there and have board certification by the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. Interestingly, historically, general surgeons have also 
done surgery within the chest uh, and, and may call themselves thoracic surgeons because they operate within the chest, but it's, in general, they do not have specialized training in cardiothoracic surgery like Dr. Nonheim or your, yourself. And so there sometimes is confusion in the media and by patients of what the difference is between a general surgeon who does some thoracic surgery as part of what they do versus a dedicated thoracic surgeon who it's all they do every day. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, your patients are children. Yes. Tell us about that. They're children and adults. Um, I think we got away from calling it pediatric uh, heart surgery because a lot of our patients are growing up to be adults that also need surgery. So we. We do the wide spectrum of ages, um, but you must be born with your problem for the most part for me to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and are you ever confused with uh, a pediatric cardiologist who might also do invasive procedures on, on children? Absolutely, I'll find um, families sometimes say their child's gone through six or seven surgeries and I'm like, wow, what were they? And they were in the cath lab getting mm -hmm. diagnostic studies mm -hmm. or um, sometimes treatments. and. So cardiologists and cardiac surgeons sometimes gets a little confused. Mm -hmm. I see the same thing sometimes. I treat coronary artery disease with coronary bypass grafting, whereas an interventional cardiologist might treat the same thing with mm -hmm. catheter-based therapy. The same thing is true with replacing aortic or repairing mitral valves or um, even doing interventional work on the thoracic aorta. Sometimes we get confused with vascular surgeons or even cardiologists who are involved in, in that kind of thing. So Keith, let's say that uh, um, I'm a member of the media and I want to write a piece about something that has to do with cardiothoracic surgery. How do I find an expert so that I know I'm getting state-of-the-art, accurate information from somebody who's really a specialist? Well, there are a couple of ways it can be done. If you're in a large city, very often what they'll do is they'll contact a university and ask to speak with a thoracic surgeon. But I think a way that's uh, uh, probably even more reliable would be to contact the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Our national office is in Chicago, downtown Chicago, and we have a, a group of surgeons who are available for tho just those sorts of informational uh, requests. Uh, it's in our society's best interests and in the patient's best interests that we make certain that the information provided both to the media and through the media to the patients is accurate and timely uh, and I think the media can best make that happen probably uh, by going through this uh, central resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Doug, let's, let's talk a little bit about quality. So I googled you last night and, and I saw on the internet that you had been reviewed by several websites with anywhere from you know, uh, quality measures from three to five stars. You did very well, by the way. Good. Um, but I was impressed that, that agencies, some of which uh, I had never heard of, had put together a lot of information about you, accurate or not accurate. I'm not even sure your address was accurate. Um, how should we be evaluated? How should the, the media look at us from a quality standpoint? Yeah, that's... It's a good question and a tough question because, uh, yes, if one now goes on the internet and Googles any, any physician, there are a number of evaluative websites that come up. Uh, and, and when you look at that information, look at it about yourself, you recognize there are aspects about it that are absolutely correct, where you went to medical school, what year you graduated. Uh, and there are other aspects that are not correct. They don't know where you live. They don't know what your specialty is. I've sometimes seen my specialty as a critical care surgeon uh, on these sites. And yes, I do critical care for my patients, but I would not consider that to be my specialty. And then there are these evaluations, these star systems that say how good I am. And most of those are based upon what we'd call administrative data at some level, which means it's data that is out of, uh, out of large data mining websites, megadata, uh, uh, that really has little to do with what the patients are that one is taking care of, what the risk adjustment is for that. And, and so I think patients and the media have to take those evaluative um, things on the internet with a grain of salt. 
There are resources, uh, and the largest one is through the SDS, which um, actually looks at uh, not individual surgeons, but looks at institutions that have agreed to share public data uh, that has risk-adjusted data and allows one to be benchmarked amongst one's peers and, and provides a quality assessment that we can do amongst each other that allows us to achieve the, the highest potential quality and opportunities for improvement. So those are available and they're important, but I think they're also often not the ones that show up on the website mm -hmm. as a star about Lauren or you or myself. So, uh, Lauren, you know, surgeons are frequently portrayed in the media. Mm -hmm. Sometimes surgeons portray themselves in the media. What, what's the responsibility of uh, either the media or television or movies or, or even the responsibility of the medical community when you put somebody on, on television? How should we be portrayed, do you think? So I think the first uh, thing is there's a lot of medical shows, and we got to remember most shows are dramas, most dramas are fiction, so most likely the portrayal uh, is not going to be that accurate on um, TV shows. But when we have um, people in our field going on, say like Dr. Oz having his own show or the doctor's show where there's a panel of um, plastic surgery, emergency medicine, OBGYN, that we really need to make sure we're portraying our field correctly and we need to make sure that the information we're getting out there is actually incredibly accurate um, and be careful not to be misinformers when we're putting ourselves in the front media. And a, a scary proportion of that, uh, that, as the British Medical Journal study suggested, a scary proportion of that information they're putting out there better than 50% has no evidence base behind it, right. no literature supporting its use. So many of those shows are uh, suggesting uh, uh, treatments or uh, treatment options or modalities which are absolutely unproven with little or no data to suggest their efficacy. And, and those really have to be taken with a giant grain of salt. Right. Um, it, it, we get portrayed- It's worse than the TV shows, uh, right? You're right, Because absolutely. we assume that we can trust those doctors that are on the shows. But the one but thing about the doctors on the, on the TV shows, on the dramas, I love that George Clooney could do brain surgery, heart surgery, right. bladder surgery. He was a <laughs> genius. Exactly. Only we could be like George. <laughs> So um, all of you have uh, written not only scientifically, but you've all written things that have uh, been published in all types of, of literature. Doug, you've been in the Wall Street Journal. Um, when you read things uh, written by or you read things about cardiothoracic surgeons, what frustrates you the most? I, I think that um, when I read things written about cardiothoracic surgeons, the thing that most commonly frustrates me is a misinterpretation of what we do. Uh, you asked this earlier, a confusion about even who we are. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually I communicated recently with a major news outlet because they were referring to a problem relating to cardiac surgery and in fact, there was no cardiac surgery involved. It was a cardiology procedure uh, uh, that had no surgical uh, involvement. And it was, to the news outlet's credit, they did correct it. But it was a headline story that said, uh, and it was negative about cardiac surgeons. Um, and I think that that's not an uncommon uh, area where we get confused or con uh, confounded with, with other groups. And I guess the other aspect is, uh, is looking for negative but outlandish stories just to, to try to make a great story. And uh, I guess some of the best stories are the ones that are just calm and great stories about somebody doing something good for other people. And I think that's what we do every day and it would be great to have those stories be a little more commonly in the media instead of an outrageous incident that just happens to be news. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, I, uh, the most emotional stories of all, and you see them all the time, are about kids mm -hmm. who have had to have surgery. What frustrates you when, you when you see those articles or you see those pieces? 
Um, often, just like uh, Dr. Wood just expressed, there will be a lot of inaccuracies in it. And you, as the congenital heart surgeon, knowing the details of those surgeries, know that they're being misrepresented and not spoken of in an accurate manner. So it's very frustrating. Um, I also don't like if I think that it's being um, put in the media to promote uh, an ulterior motive as opposed to actually just trying to get the word out about the child or the family or the disease process. And one of the things that, that, that bothers, I think, all of us is when they portray a negative incident. And the God's honest truth is this is high-risk surgery. These are very sick patients, and, and not all our results are successful. We lose patients. Anybody doing this level of surgery is unfortunately going to lose a patient uh, uh, now and again, and it's a, it's a tragedy. But when it gets portrayed as oh, that was a mistake, oh, that was routine. And when they portray that without doing a proper risk assessment, without putting it in the proper perspective where the patient was uh, essentially facing certain death uh, on his or her deathbed and we tried to save them, just couldn't pull it off this time and suddenly it's our fault that they died. Those are the kinds of things where it's really frustrating. That's where, as Doug suggested, mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's so important for these rating systems not to be on administrative data and not to be anecdotal, a single case in the Wall Street Journal or the LA Times. Uh, it, we we want to be judged. We want to be rated. We, we look at that because when we judge and rate ourselves, we see where we can improve. We need that kind of help. But we want it done fairly, and the only way to do that fairly is to make certain you have accurate data that's risk-adjusted so sick patients are not going to do as well as otherwise healthy patients. Uh, and when you get accurate risk-adjusted data, bring it on. That's what we want. We, we need to know the truth so we can get better. So, I, and I was yes, just going to add to that that I was thinking about when I, when I am consuming the media, what do I like? What I most like is the last segment of the news show, which is making a difference. Yes. That's the thing that somebody's doing something good. So actually, I think that's what people would like to see more than what did somebody do wrong or uh, what mistake can we find in a, or a gotcha moment. I mean, those it's, a, it's relevant for the media. I get that, but I think stories that could uh, emphasize the, the good that people do for each other are, are much more uplifting and for me they sell the news. So I'm a young medical reporter um, give me a piece of advice. Seek out uh, experts in the field don't go with the local doctor who may or may not be an expert in the field who wants to give you their advice who uh, um, likes being on TV uh, and get a balanced approach. If you get a negative finding or if you get a negative opinion, make certain you seek out the alternate, uh, the alternate uh, opinion uh, because there is no such thing as a one-sided coin. Lauren. Do your homework. I mean, I think in journalism they understand that. I mean, do your research. Uh, make sure you have accurate information and don't, you know, be proud of what you, your segments you're producing. And the only way you can do that is being accurate and doing your homework. Doug, the last word. Yeah, I, I was, I was going to say what Lauren said. I think that um, journalists pride themselves on, on becoming experts in the thing that they're talking about, and I think that is what they should do. And Keith gave the tools for doing that. A and, you know, when, when we think of lawyers that we work with, lawyers that we work with on either side in, in, in medical liability cases, they often know as much about medicine as the doctors do because they've self-educated and they really know their stuff. Um, and journalists can be the same way. Uh, journalists can know, learn the field, do their homework so that they work with an expert and get the accurate news out. Great advice. So this has been really enjoyable and informative. Uh, I should just say for any questions uh, regarding media about cardiothoracic surgery, uh, that there is a media relations department of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. They can be reached at media at sts.org. Have a nice day.